Welcome to the Mental Disorder Podcast. I'm Jonah Davids, and with me today is Stephen Ide. Stephen is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor at City Journal. He researches social policy questions with a focus on homelessness and mental illness. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jonah. One thing that I thought was very cool when I was looking up your background prior to this was that you studied great books and you studied political philosophy. I personally am a big fan of philosophy and political philosophy in particular. So I was wondering, how does someone go from studying political philosophy, which is quite abstract and is is very sort of values oriented to working on more concrete social policy questions? How did you make that journey? Well, mostly by accident, I guess, like like many people, uh, I didn't, you know, set out to do it this way. But um, I mean, you know, like many people, I, when I went to college, I realized that I liked being in college and wanted to kind of stretch it out as long as I could in grad school. And maybe eventually a life in academia seemed like a good way to do that. During dissertation phase, I started doing policy work for a small thing tank in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, a lot having to do with kind of urban issues, city issues. When the realities of the, the brutal academic job market began to set in, I you know, started to become more and more attracted to policy work full time. So that's what I've basically been doing, kind of urban type issues, a basket of urban policy stuff. Um, I've been at the Manhattan Institute, my current employer since 2012, and I haven't always been working on homelessness and mental health. But Manhattan Institute is a place where you find conservative center-right people who are interested in cities and all the challenges cities are facing. So beginning of my tenure at MI, I was working a lot on sort of municipal bankruptcy, fiscal problems, and shifted more and more to the homelessness and mental illness questions that are just you know so unrelenting, especially in New York. Always have been, but really picked up in the 2010s. And as far as like, you know, bringing a background in philosophy to bear, I mean, I think a lot of times it, in the end, it does come down to the word values that you used. You know, it's sort of studying the history of political philosophy is kind of the study of the history of value systems, moral, moral value systems. And I'm abidingly interested in how that structures our debates about, you know, what we disagree about, what the problems are, and also what solutions are we willing to consider? Right. I mean, I always find when I'm arguing with people, I always try and establish as soon as possible, do we disagree over facts or values? Because a lot of the time, no matter what facts you put forward, if the people just disagree with you about what things are permissible or not, or which are which goals are noble or not, then you're just not going to get anywhere. Right. And I'm, um, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the idea that, you know, we need to focus more on, you know, quote, what works or just do, you know, more and more kind of quantitative research or evaluations of existing programs that kind of point away towards, quote, you know, facts or evidence based policymaking, as it's sometimes called, and away from taking values on head on. I'm sympathetic to that approach because it's hard to take on values head on, particularly, and it gets harder and harder every year. But even if you are just kind of looking for ways to agree with people and looking for ways to kind of structure debates in a um, constructive way that enables you to maybe agree with somebody about something, it's really important to keep in mind the way that values structure everything. Because otherwise, you can wind up backing into this situation where you think that social science questions, public policy efforts are science, you know, like physical science, like, you know, we just figure out what the right hypothesis is and go with that. But it can't ever work like that because we disagree about values. Right. And I think one of the interesting developments that you've written about is the rise of relativism and how relativism impacts these kinds of debates over values. So relativism is basically, I mean, there's different forms of it. There's moral relativism, cultural relativism. But at the end of the day, it's basically people saying there can't really be agreement about values. And since nobody can agree, then sort of everyone should retreat to their own corner and do their own thing. In your piece, Political Theory for the Homeless, which I think is in the the Law and Liberty Journal, you sort of talk about how relativism has infected the homelessness debate. Yeah, you know, I think that this idea, this term relativism was kind of like a bigger deal, maybe in like the 80s and 90s when the culture wars were really getting revved up. Um, Alan Bloom in his book, Close in the American Mind, talked a lot about relativism. Now, my sense is that people dismiss the importance of relativism because, for one reason, they see people who, who are staking out these like very obviously non-relativistic positions. Very committed, very ideological, very sure of what think of justice and truth are. So it's like, where is this relativism stuff? But I think that ultimately, if what relativism comes down to is... Um, you know, 
a fundamental doubt about standards, about, about, about objective standards, that you won't, you won't ever get to a place where you can agree on standards for nature, objective standards, you still find yourself just in terms of kind of needing to function in life and participating in debates and deciding what to do with taxpayer dollars, having to come up with some sort of basis for why what you want to do is the right thing to do. You can't retreat to um, the Bible. You can't retreat to some natural law, some conception of human nature, because relativism forbids that. But you got to come up with something. And I feel that if you look at the way that this concept of lived experience and other notions that are somehow derived from, I think, um, thinking about mental health, human psychology in the 20th century, you see a kind of a search for some sort of standard to use that will support positions, that will give them credence, maybe not ultimately, but enough to, in order to, for you to win the day, rhetorically speaking. You know, if someone is basing an argument about how a homeless shelter should run, and they're basing that argument on the fact that they once stayed in a homeless shelter, and they know what it's like, and you don't, and they suffered as a result of that experience, that will give them an advantage in that debate. And all of us, you know, will sometimes recur to experience and anecdotes and something that happened to us. And it enables you to kind of move forward with your position, even if it doesn't settle anything. But ultimately, it does, I think, have a kind of clouding effect um, on these debates. Just something that I noticed in the, in the homelessness debate. Right. You know, in the mental illness field as well, I certainly see any new project right there has to be a ton of public consultation and people coming forward and saying you know i had this experience and i think it's especially difficult to judge those experiences accurately because when people are in terrible circumstances everything is going to feel terrible to them so that adds like another layer i sort of see now a partnership between sort of on the one hand technocratic kind of policymakers who are are not doing what you were talking about which is values sort of oriented policy making they're sort of teaming up with the lived experience on the ground people. And you kind of have that combination is driving a lot of the policy discussion. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's a very unstable alliance. I, I think ultimately it doesn't really work. I mean, because lived experience, you know, anyone can invoke it. And if you look hard enough, you can find people with lived experiences that point in very different directions than the people who are loudest in invoking that. But there will be these expeditious or opportunistic coalitions being formed to advance an idea that people have just decided that they wanted to get behind. So, you know, figuring out how to kind of get your footing in these debates does wind up figuring out how to respond on the one hand to those kind of technocratic, yeah, evidence-based, like articles that appear in peer-reviewed journals, and on the other hand, the sort of, you know, personal lived experience stuff. Housing first is sort of one of these issues where there's been this kind of team up. And housing first is the idea that even though the biggest problems facing the homeless are unemployment and a lack of sobriety, the policy consensus has just become everyone just needs to get housed. That should be the first priority. And we'll deal with those other issues later. Because the problem is they don't have homes. We give them homes. The problem is essentially solved. And doing that is kind of, I think, as you describe it, putting a lower end above a higher end, right? So the, the higher end would be self-sustainability. People are able to live their own lives and uh, support themselves. The lower end is sort of what you get as a result of that, which is just, okay, you can now, you now have your own home. But this has sort of been inverted. So my question is, if the ultimate goal of homelessness policy is ultimately, or is defined at least as ultimately to get people off the streets, why should we care about the process behind it? Why should we care that the person gets a job themselves, gets clean themselves, and then is able to afford their own home versus just fixing the problem instantly? Yeah, well, it's kind of a fabricated concept, homelessness. It's not a term that we always used. It was it, it gained currency in like the early 80s. And it's always been, it had this kind of umbrella or abstract nature to it. It groups together a lot of different types of people. And people who individually, if you get to know them, you know, they have various things went wrong for them in their lives. Um, they made bad decisions, bad things happened to them. Um, and so it's a mix. It's a mix of problems. But 
the, the consensus view in homelessness that's and it's often defined as, as the philosophy of housing first is that well we're not saying that those other problems don't exist but let's just what's in common with all these people is that they don't have unstable housing they don't have stable housing that's what we need to think about as the most important problem let's work on that and then eventually we'll we'll talk about getting to that other stuff later um it was you know originally to some extent rooted in lived experience type reasoning um the very uh the guy who kind of invented housing first had this experience working with street homeless people in New York City in the late 80s and said you know whatever i would talk to homeless people what they really said was they wanted they wanted housing. That's what they'd always say. Why don't we just listen to them and kind of go with that? And then it gained this kind of academic sheen through these peer-reviewed studies that were published to the point where by the 2000s, people were saying, no, 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 this really is science. You know, this is the only serious solution to homelessness. People who are proposing other things to respond to homelessness, they're doing that because they are running a program that they want to keep going for like self-interested reasons, or they're sort of moralistic ideologues they're not scientists they're not serious people and um you know it's just it's just very frustrating because there's still an expectation a lot of us when we're talking about you know public safety or public education child welfare homelessness mental health whatever that there should be some sort of ability for civil debate about it like i'm not saying i will be able to convince you completely of my position but we should be able to be like work through our different positions in a way that rules out certain things, but comes together in some sort of compromise um, parameters, both both in terms of our understanding of the problem and also the solutions. But when one side is saying that or we're backed by science and you're backed by something else, civil debate really is not possible. It's very similar to the sort of abolitionist you know, viewpoint, or Black Lives Matter for that. Like, well, I'm in favor of Black lives mattering. And you're saying you're against my agenda. So I guess that means, I mean, just by defining your position in a certain way, it seems like you're not even interested in, in debating things. And that seems to be happening more and more across various policy fields. Right. Like you're against goodness and wellness and happiness and puppies. Yeah. I mean, the abolitionist thing, you know, that's a common term in, in criminal justice right now. We're abolitionists, which means if you are against our position because you think our research is flawed, that we have contradictions, you are in favor of slavery. That's basically morally what you come down to. Is part of the problem that people such as yourselves who are advocating for more of a I'm not sure what the technical term is, maybe a stepwise approach to recovery for homelessness or something like that, is the problem that there hasn't been enough money funneled into scientific studies showing that this works, is the problem that you just haven't been able to convince these people because they have their own sort of ideological agenda. Is there evidence behind this or is this really a values-driven approach? I mean, I, I think there is a kind of sociology of knowledge aspect to this. The people doing academic research in homelessness you know, are overwhelmingly progressive. I mean, they're academics to begin with, and then they are also academics who focus on, you know, sociological questions. And so, I mean, I'm sorry, what kind of person is that? So it's, it's a person who's going to have a kind of focus. But, but it comes down to, I mean, I'm not saying that their research is like made up or bogus or something, but, um, you know, you're going to focus your research attentions in a certain direction and maybe not look very carefully about other things. When enough research gets done and the debate and the and the um the literature gets developed, you know, you do start noticing things. And, you know, one question that comes up is, well, if you're defining success as housing stability, um, what about people who define success differently? What be what about people who are interested not just in whether or not a program keeps somebody housed for a couple of years, but whether or not that person made any progress in um, becoming more sober and um, becoming more compliant with medication regimens and reuniting with family members and being less uh, isolated socially and working and like leaving his apartment. It's, you know, it seems pretty clear that this, um, that the housing first approach, that housing as an intervention on its own is really not going to do very much with those other things which normal people would say are kind of interesting. They seem important in terms of what kind of life we're making for people. But the tendency is to focus narrowly on the housing stability measure. And, you know, we can talk about how successful housing is 
versus other programs measured in terms of housing stability, who you're putting in this type of housing, what the housing look like, how long you're measuring it for. Those are all these kind of social science questions. But again, getting into this question of values, if you are leaving out those other outcomes, if, or if you're diminishing them, you say, well, they're just not as important as housing stability, then um, you know, you're going to come up with a very different conception of what ev- an evidence-based policy looks like. Right. And it's, it's also interesting because I think part of this, this values bundle is sort of an emancipatory view of the homeless, right? So there's, there's a sense that the homeless are sort of a victim of a capitalist system, right? Or, you know, depending on their race or gender, other kinds of oppressive systems. And so it's not really the people who are running homeless uh, programs or governments really have no right to tell these people what to do with their time, with their money. Uh, Those things cannot be used as leverage, for example, to grant or deny housing, um, because that would sort of be infringing on this free, fully functioning person who just happened to not have a home. Yeah, they say that type of stuff all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, every... Everyone has dignity. We treat everyone with dignity. Well, okay, but what are you? Where are you going with that? What does that mean in practice? Respecting the autonomy of everyone. And this is based on choice. You, when you have to sign a lease for an apartment, you don't have to like say that you're going to, you know, comply with service requirements and like meet with case managers and, you know, um, take your medications. You know, you just need to pay your rent. And other than that, you're not, you know, you don't have all these requirements. Why should someone else, just because they've been on the street, have expectations or requirements for the receipt of their housing benefits? It's it's independent housing. That's the idea. Like it's it, it, they can have they can achieve independence in housing just as much as everyone else. And it's paternalistic to think that they can't. Um, and uh, you know, you're you're you yeah you really are kind of infantilizing them by not thinking that they can, um, you know, achieve independent housing just as much as any other non-homeless person can. Earlier, you alluded to how definitions of the homeless have changed over time, right? Could you expand on that a bit? Because I saw in a a video of yours that you put on uh, giving a lecture, you talk about this, and it really changed my view of the issue so much. So can you sort of explain how the term homeless has sort of evolved over time and was originally composed of other terms? And how our use today is just so different than what was originally envisioned. Yeah, for my book, I did research about homelessness going back to the 19th century in America. And, um, you know, it's a term that, I mean, it pops up every so often, but it, it, went, it goes completely viral around 1980. And when the advocates who were active at that time have told old war stories, they've been perfectly open that that was deliberate. That they wanted a new term that would be less stigmatizing, but would also focus everyone's attention on the housing aspect of the problem. And that would replace all the previous terms that had been in currency, derelict, vagrant, bum, tramp, and hobo. And those were terms that sound very non-PC and no one uses them, but they had a certain meaning, actually, especially bum, tramp, and hobo going way back. Whereas, you know, hobo was sort of the like freewheeling, footloose, Traveling worker, so transient worker, catch rides on freight trains and go around the country working, especially in agriculture. And the tramp was somebody who was very mobile, who would move around, but didn't work very much. He used his wits to get by. He was the, the tramp was particularly of great fascination to writers and poets, like people like Jack London types who were fascinated by this subculture. It was kind of like a subculture, like the hippies or beats. This um, this tramp subculture, and then you had the bums who were like old, disabled, former tramps, hobos. They didn't move. They didn't work. And those were the hobos and tramps kind of faded from the scene. But you definitely had bums around in the 1950s and 60s. And at that time, the interesting thing to me about using these different words is that they don't assume that the only thing wrong with this person's life is that he doesn't have housing instability. They're different in these certain sorts of ways. He has various problems, but housing is not, you know, doesn't really define the type of housing he uses doesn't really define him. Now, it does. That's what's defining is they don't have, you know, a a lease with their name on it. They're not housed. And so, you know, single moms, the couple gets living in a shelter, Um, a, you know, someone living on the streets of San Francisco with a fentanyl addiction, a a seriously mentally ill person just out of the hospital living in the subways 
of New York, you know, run, runaway teens. Now in New York City, we have these, this huge vagrant. They're all homeless. They're all this. Yeah, maybe they have these differences, but just think of them all as homeless because that's what we need to do in order to make progress with this. Right. And uh, in doing so, right, the the values of the definition are changed where it's now a thing that can't be questioned, right? It becomes, I mean, even now they're moving away, the, the, say people with homelessness or, you know, things like that. Yeah, the unhoused people experiencing homelessness. But the thing that's interesting about that is it still keeps that abstract umbrella nature of the definition in place. Right. And what you're saying is that in previous times with the different characterizations of, of bum, tramp or hobo and things like that, people did not assume, oh, this person's main problem is they don't have a house. People sort of, I guess, viewed it as a character problem or in, in some cases, not a problem at all. Right. This is just a person who's who's working, who's riding the rails, who's moving you know, from from place to place. Maybe it's not the most ideal life, but it's hard to stop these people because they're seeking opportunity. You know, it's funny because it's now the definition they would say like it's stigmatized and things like that. But in some sense, it's really not the same or it's become stigmatized because it's it's brought in this really negative connotation based on who is now sort of, you know, umbrellaed underneath it. It makes me think, too, you know, I, I feel the definition of mental health or mental illness today is so wide compared to what it used to be. I imagine back in 1950 or even 1970, perhaps, if you said, oh, Johnny has a mental illness. People would think, oh, this is someone with a very serious mental illness. This is someone who has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, serious case, some extreme outlier. Whereas now, like one in five people, they say are, are mentally ill or have a mental illness. The term has expanded into this umbrella term that sort of can mean anything from a person who can't live their life at all unsupervised to somebody who has mild anxiety. Do you think there's sort of a political process to these terms expanding is the goal that if we get more people to become defined under these terms, then we'll have more money for it. We can say it's a bigger problem. Do you think that's a conscious effort on on part of activists or even people in the medical field? I think it's a very big question. It's a really, really just large historical development that happened in the 20th century. I mean, it, it continues to expand and it, it, it more and more, more more diagnoses and more people saying they have a diagnosis that keeps happening. Um, but it does go back a number of decades back in the fifties and sixties in the Freudian era, there were, you know, people were talking about, well, where, where is this idea of the therapeutic culture? Where is this headed? Where, you know, you know taking pills seems to be becoming normalized very, very rapidly amongst like housewives or something like, what does that, what does that mean? Freud at that time, Freud now is kind of a discredited figure, particularly in the practice of mental health. But, you know, at that time he was considered like right up there with like Isaac Newton and Einstein. Like he had made this discovery that people like just didn't know about the world of like the, you know, the self, human psychology, the, in, this interior world, you know, that now that many, and many people still believe it that like that's real or like you know we when we get into that lived experience thing it's like well why do we think that we as individuals have more objective access to ourselves than somebody else kind of observing us from the exterior um because sometimes we make a lot of mistakes when we think about ourselves well that's because of you know of the Freudian revolution i think or in particularly the way it was interpreted and spread the message was spread um but you can you can measure it you know you can you can measure the number of diagnoses the, the official mental health diagnoses um and mental disorders that are recognized by the diagnostic and statistical manual the bible the american psychiatric association which is now in its fifth edition um which tells you something that it's been updated so many times. Well, has psychiatric knowledge like advanced so much over the decades? Um, or are we like kind of close to where do we just use these different terms? You know, hundreds of diagnoses now, there were far fewer when it was first. And things have and things have been taken out. A classic example is homosexuality, which was taken out in the third edition of the DSM. And I think people know that that happened, but they don't understand what the meaning of that is in terms of psychiatry as a science, that there was a push coming out of the civil rights revolution in the 1960s to remove homosexuality as a mental disorder from the DSM. But psychiatrists understood that there wasn't any new like medical knowledge that justified it or new treatment or, or you know, 
you know, it was purely social, non-medical pressures that were forcing them to do that. So if they went along, like, what does that mean for the integrity of psychiatry? And it's been in question, you know, ever since, you know, why in another thing that happened in addition to the kind of social political pressures, you know, what's stigmatized um, is the role that it plays in getting insurance reimbursement for some sort of treatment that you want. If you want access to a therapist or, or services for your child um, in school is another place that comes up. You really need to get some sort of formal diagnosis, something in that book that then opens up access to the services that you want It's really just threaded throughout American life and all these systems that so many people rely on now that it's really hard to see how we get back to this idea of a much narrower range of both diagnoses and people who get diagnosed with something. My guess is that the people who have suffered the most from this have probably been the most seriously mentally ill because suddenly all these, all this range of science and services, healthcare that was for them is now being shared with everybody. And they, in some sense, lose the potency of the language. Now, now people, I'm sure, would say, well, they were stigmatized by that language. But that's kind of the point, is they had something that was really, really bad, and they needed really bad, you know, extra help. Now, we've sort of spread that so thin. And I think, I think there's an argument that, well, everything is sort of on a spectrum, right? And, you know, where does somebody go from being kooky to being having psychosis or, you know, schizophrenia or something? Like, there's, there's that kind of argument that it's all sort of a spectrum and we don't want to have harsh definitions. But by not drawing those lines in the sand, like we actually end up making it more difficult for people who have serious mental illnesses to properly get help and be treated as people who have a serious condition. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to think that things have gotten like dramatically better for schizophrenic Americans over over recent decades. First, so first of all, you have the question of like the distribution of resources. If you're saying you're going to do something for mental health and you're really mean doing something for people who don't have schizophrenia or serious mental illness, well, they lose out on that. But it also affects the kind of the way that we think about what's an appropriate intervention for people. If we're if we mean voluntary taking medication and voluntarily taking up therapy, and that's what the delivery of mental health services means, well, then it becomes kind of a conundrum when like some people don't do that. So what happens with the service resistant people? What happens with the people who are so sick, they don't know that they're sick. They don't have insight into their illness and they just refuse. It's a government keeps expanding. We keep offering more services and they decline to take them. It's hard to think about, well, wait a minute, they have a mental disorder. That's what we do for people with mental disorders. Why does it not work with them? In a way, when we did less for, especially in a public sense, for mental disorders, it was easy to understand why we needed something like a psychiatric hospital, which very few people with some sort of mental disorder need, but those hardest cases really do need it. And it becomes hard for us to understand exactly, you know, well, why are they so different? Because this is all normal. Like everyone has this stuff to some degree. And you see, especially, I mean, I've seen frequently over the past maybe decade, every once in a while, somebody will publish an op-ed in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or something, Guardian sort of saying, I have a mental illness, but like my life is totally fine, right? Yeah. And the goal, the goal of that, I think there are different goals. I think they see, they perceive the goal of that as destigmatizing like the, the 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 thing that i went through lots of people go through if you go through it you'll be okay it's tough but you get through it that's kind of their intention i think the message it really sends is that this is actually not that serious some economists recently they published this sort of piece on the on the me- the economics of of mental illness which i wrote about a little bit for my blog and they have some data from the uh, national longitudinal survey of youth all the all the waves and you can see that if somebody, say, has like a serious episode of depression in one wave, but not in the other two, they're going to be probably okay. They have a decent chance of being employed, being married, these kinds of things. But when you look at the people who are depressed in, severely depressed in all three waves, on average, they have very, very, very low rates of not being unemployed, getting married, just really sort of basic life fundamentals. And so I think in some sense, our goal of being more inclusive of everybody and indeed there are people right who have these conditions who have they get through it maybe either the sometimes the conditions are mild or sometimes they just themselves are more fortuitous or something like that but by opening up that 
what was previously sort of a binary people didn't want to cross to the sort of mushy continuum, I think we actually lose sense of the gravity and the seriousness of these problems. Oh, I definitely agree with that. There was a big effort in the 2010s in New York City laid by the mayor who wanted to make a kind of comprehensive mental health system. Part of that was putting up subway ads saying exactly what you said, like everybody has a mental disorder. Using therapy or medication services is normal. You shouldn't be. That's what the stigma thing really comes down to, this idea that if people are ashamed to admit they have a mental disorder, um, that's a barrier to care, that, they, they'll, that it will prevent them from receiving the, from pursuing the care and treatment that they need. But, you know, for the most serious people, it's probably not stigma that's the biggest barrier to care. So it's just one of those those ways in which, you know, when you're especially when you're talking about kind of public science, public health, public enlightenment, we seem to be going backwards in this when we're talking about like the ordinary person's understanding about some sort of, you know, scientific or medical uh, question. Um, and as a result of these um, basically policy interventions to encourage them to think about something in ways that's, you know, not really accurate, not, not, not grounded in the, the reality. Yeah. And speaking sort of of the lower versus higher goods you discussed earlier, I think for people who are not seriously mentally ill, but are going through, you know, what could be a mild sort of case of, of mental illness, or it could just be just normal life. I think a lot of them are, are being denied, actually, the achievement of those higher goods, right? Like if, if there's problems in your life, and I think, I think this is why Jordan Peterson is, is so popular as sort of a you know, cultural commentator, but also a mental health professional, is he says to people, you have to fix your life. You can take a pill, sure, you can do therapy, sure, but at the end of the day, like, you're probably sad because your life sucks and you probably suck and you have to you know, improve yourself, become a better person, become you know, stronger. I think a lot of people like that message because they sort of feel like when they go to therapy or they see a mental health professional, they're just sort of being offered the end, which is, oh, you're just going to feel better. And they do want to feel better, but they also desire to live the kind of life that a better person would live, right? And so I just, you know, part of this, some of this sort of cut to the chase um, aspects of it, I think, are, are problematic for, for ordinary people. I do think there are people who take, ment- you know, they take antidepressants or something, they feel better, maybe they can then go live that life, improve, nothing wrong with that. But psychiatry, to a large degree, seems more focused, and perhaps this is just because they have limited time, limited resources, but on the sort of lower good at the expense of the higher one. Well, yeah, and we have a lot of people who are providing mental health services who aren't even necessarily psychiatrists right now, like all kinds of clinical professions. It's interesting to me the way we talk about these problems and the, the sort of way in which people prefer to have something that sounds like scientific to describe something that may be actually a moral thing, you know, like the terms unhappiness versus depression. Um, I My sense is that if somebody is going through a kind of dark period, they're down, it's kind of persisting, it's not really... You know, not major red flags going up, but they would prefer not to be like that. Um, when they're describing what they're going through, were they to say, well, I'm unhappy, that would seem vague, imprecise, just unsatisfying. Whereas saying that you're depressed seems to po- just be a more serious way to gra- at least define what you're, what you're dealing with. But it's not obvious to me that unhappiness is a worse word. Maybe unhappiness is a better word because it, there's a certain openness there as to whether or not it's actually like a medical thing where you need to be thinking about, well, what does my insurance pay for? And, you know, what type of, you know, medication or therapy regimen would be, would be good for me? Um, because it does seem to be the case that for, for people, a totally non-medical change in their life, like a different job or different social circumstances is what would really make the biggest difference. So I think it begins with the language and the way that we think about these things and the way that we have this kind of reverence for science um, still, even after all the times that science and scientific authorities have let us down, um, that um, um, is kind of frustrating, I think, and, and, and leads and seems to lead closer to truth, but in a way creates kind of barriers to clear thinking. One theory I kind of have around that is that 
when you have the sort of threads of a culture, things everybody can agree upon, normative values sort of disintegrating, and you now have many people with many different sort of values agreeing and disagreeing, then people retreat to science, right? Because, okay, science is sort of at value neutral, right? Which it's not, but we say it is. Um, and especially biological science, right? We, we, that sort of brings people some comfort, like, oh, I'm not depressed. It has nothing to do with me. It has all to do with chemicals in my brain or my body. Um, and to some true, I mean, that's true to some extent by definition, right? Like the sadness you feel is a chemical phenomenon, right? But if you phrase it biologically, it sort of takes out the, the moral aspects of it. Um, and I kind of wonder if, I mean, I think in psychiatry, but I also think in other aspects of health, like public health, uh, mental health, um, even some things around physical health too, but it, we sort of are, are pulling away the moral language. And the only people who are sort of left to make moral pronouncements are these health officials who they say, well, you know, we're not, we have no values. We're just telling you what the science says. And don't look at what this, the values of the people who made the sciences. But as long as everybody agrees, you know, on, on what we're doing, then it's going to be fine. I think you can kind of see, see that in perhaps psychiatry. I mean, I, I I imagine people wrote about this during the sort of anti-psychiatry movement about psychiatry, you know, being sort of a new source of moral authority. I mean, they have a lot of, in some sense, physical authority over who can be, you know, locked up or not. But basically, these medical institutions becoming a substitute for the moral decisions that previously communities or, or states or countries would have made. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it has. If we're going to keep doing that um, in America, we looks like we're going to need to keep doing that. We need some sort of authority to to decide when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, and that has to be some sort of medical authority. It has to be psychiatrists. Yeah, there. Um, so it does come down to how much you trust psychiatrists to make those right, the right call to deprive someone of their freedom versus not. It's you know it's a relatively rare thing in a country with over three hundred million people, um, but it's very important to the functioning of the mental health system, as particularly the. Um, as that pertains to the seriously mentally ill. That anti-psychiatry movement, which is, you know, really interesting in a lot of ways, had libertarian roots in, in part. Um, there was there were people on the right and people on the left who were who participated in it. And sometimes you will see it still see libertarians who kind of keep the faith with that, who are still um very resolute in denying the legitimacy of involuntary commitment based upon the fact that mental illness is, is this kind of fabricated or just elusive notion i mean you have the question of scientific authority to begin with and then you have the question of psych is psychiatry itself a science like you know the question of scientific authority this is the question that we went through with with covid and it goes in cycles we've we've gone through it a lot i mean way earlier in the 20th century when nuclear weapons were developed people were like well wait a minute we've we're really far over our skis in terms of how our scientific advancement has gone beyond our moral advancement because the human race, do we really trust the human race to be able to like morally responsibly deal with these, you know, powers that we, we've given ourselves in various other forms. This has come up. Do, how much do we trust the science, the scientists, you know, bio, it's a bioethics question as well. But then even if you say, okay, sometimes it's appropriate to, to trust scientists, people will question psychiatry's claim to be as firm of, of a medical discipline as, you know, cardiology or, or, or something. And that's partly because of, these, of the things we were touching earlier, shifting nature of mental diagnoses, and, and to some extent, just frustration with how uh, far we've not how how little progress we've made in the treatment of mental illnesses when other treatments seem to have made some progress. That may not be fair to blame all on psychiatry, but it does create this kind of um, insecurity and certainty that hangs over psychiatry and has been there for a while. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's interesting because when you look at sort of developments in psychiatry today, people are doing stuff on the sort of genetic front. There's a lot of effort to try and sort of come up with not a new DSM, but sort of a new classification system, where increasingly people are sort of, sort of starting to think, okay, everything is correlated with everything. So there's sort of these almost more like clusters, rather than individual concrete categories and diagnoses. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting, because I think psychiatry is still trying to evolve and, and push forward its, its legitimacy. But on the other hand, I think in many ways has internalized, you know, many of the critiques that were made against it, 
in, 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 I mean, I, I would imagine your average psychiatrist today, right, is someone who's mostly doing prescriptions, which is very, very different than, you know, probably your average psychiatrist a long, a long time ago, mostly prescribing antidepressants or Adderall or something like that, and, and doing less sort of, um, I don't know, qualitative patient care or something like that. That's changed. I mean, I, I find it interesting that the, the sort of right or center right has chosen its base to be psychiatry. I guess, I guess perhaps because, I mean, in this debate, they're sort of resting their, their moral authority on psychiatry and psychiatrists, whereas the left is sort of going to the lived experience kind of thing. Is, is that a fair characterization? I mean, I think on both the center left and center right, to the extent that these things map onto the mental health debate, there's respect for psych- psychiatrists, for sure. I think that you've actually found more radical anti-psychiatry stuff, more mainstream, back in the 1960s, partly as an offshoot of civil rights movement, but partly because deinstitutionalization was then just getting going. And after deinstitutionalization like didn't work out, and modern homelessness and other problems such as related to violence and incarceration... People are now, you know, inclined to think that serious mental illness is not made up, that it's it's a real thing. And um, thus, and that we also will need um, psychiatrists who have extensive experience and knowledge of serious mental illness and also can prescribe medication regimens that we're going to need them to deal with it. Um, and certainly people in my area center left center writers are very receptive to the extent they understand it about the idea that we uh have a shortage of psychiatrists that we have to sort of dragoon other healthcare professionals other mental health professionals to provide some sort of services to seriously mentally ill people because we don't have enough psychiatrists available geographically speaking and also to work with the seriously mentally ill um it really would be good if we could do more um, about that. So yeah, I'm pro psychiatry. I mean, I've, I've tried to, you know, understand the, you know, the limits of where the knowledge is, and I don't want to exaggerate what we can do with, for example, just medication alone, but I certainly feel like we need to, yeah, respect and promote the role of psychiatrists if we're going to get anywhere with serious mental illness. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of psychiatrists, there, there are some who are, you know, true believers in everything they've been taught, but a lot of them are sort of aware, okay, you know, We've had this history. There are these changes. We're not infallible, and yet we're valuable, right? I do agree. It's it's important to try and uh, get those people into those professions because there's just such a shortage in mental health care workers, basically of all kinds. One one thing that I've thought a lot about is, you know, could you sort of fast track people who are doing this training? Because I mean, they spend so long in medical school if they're going to be psychiatrists, but if they're going to be psychologists, it's also a very, very long process, right? Um, you have to do a PhD and exams, with years and years of work. I mean, wouldn't it make sense, do you think, to, as a policy response to the shortage to just try and lower the accreditation and get more and more people uh, into these professions quicker? Uh, I don't know. I, I, that specific question is an interesting one. I just don't know enough about whether or not it... Um, I mean, historically, what has happened when you try to expand the number of psychiatrists, it's, 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 it's the same thing we talked about earlier, like you're expanding like your mental health. They go off and they do something other than serious mental illness. So whatever the training or expertise that we think is really needful, it's particularly serious mental illness. So that would be the question I would have is, you know, how many years, you know, what kind of requirements you need for that? Um, and, um, I don't know because people, you know, they're, they're hard to deal with and it does take, you know, the same medication regimen doesn't work for everybody. And sometimes their initial diagnosis are messed up. Like for example, in rural America, you know, they have a lot of experience by this point with, with opioid recovery. There's a lot that, that even very red state places can do for you if you're interested in services for, um, recovery, you know, family doctors, like primary care doctors who know to dispense medication assistant treatment and all this stuff but they're real deserts when it comes to working with somebody with serious mental illness schizophrenia um so whatever we do in terms of rejiggering our you know credentials or uh, training regimen we really need to make sure that it goes in that direction and it appreciates this dimension of the problem i want to shift the topic just slightly to 
you wrote an article uh, for National Review recently called To Help the Mentally Ill Help Their Families. And I thought this was a very good um, appeal to the sort of um, family's uh, first agenda, which has sort of become, I think, a new element of the right recently, and I think quite a popular one. You know, we see successes around education policy, family leave policy. There's basically a sense that, okay, the core unit is supposed to or should be the family, not the individual. We've sort of miscalibrated on that. And what kind of policies can we do to help the family? I think you paint a very uh, emotive and striking picture of the kind of care for people with serious mental illnesses without, you know, a proper background of, of mental health institutions falls disproportionately on families. I have a quote here. Let me just find it. The quote is, families bear great burdens under the community integration regime. That severely troubled man you sometimes pass during your morning commute, imagine being responsible for him. Imagine having to argue with him day in and day out over taking his meds, about why his attendance at that reputable day program has been dwindling, and whether the CIA is spying on him. The mentally ill have trouble holding down a job and performing basic tasks, such as grocery shopping. They have trouble interpreting social cues, so they may not grasp, for instance, that a person is kidding. Their personal hygiene can leave much to be desired. They can be convinced that celebrities or long-dead historical figures are their personal confidants and that total strangers are passionately in love with them. So yeah, I, when I read that, I thought, yeah, this is what people are missing, right? Is as tragic as it is for that person to have that mental illness or to be separated from their family. I mean, not like permanently. I mean, the family will come and visit them and, and things like that. But the flip side of that is the family is then responsible for that person. I don't know, you know, much about about the empirics behind it, but I imagine as well that those families, I mean, most of them probably do not do a good job taking care of those people or making sure that they get the help they need just because to take care of a person like that is such an extreme uh, responsibility. In the case of mental health, like you have this very interesting situation where I think that if you think about the history of kind of the welfare state, um, American social change over the course of the 20th century, you generally think of government taking the place of families, generally speaking. So we used to rely more on the family for our safety net. Now there's this big government safety net that has kind of crowded that out. Mental health goes works in the opposite way. Mental health back earlier in the 20th century, if you had an adult relative with schizophrenia, you were not expected to take care of them. There was a home for him. You sent him away. Um, similarly with developmental disability, by the way. Now it's the complete opposite expectation. The responsible family keeps the child. They, they care for him. It's, it's, it's on them. And so, in a way, if you're somebody who likes the idea that civil society solutions to problems are kind of more nimble and, um, you know, can just like the natural way to deal with these problems with when government doesn't, you know, get in the way, you know, you should like this. And in some cases it does work out, you know, um, but a lot of cases it doesn't. And we need to sort of rethink the relationship between government and family and not just make one responsible for everything. So that points in the direction of certain, yeah, I think, you know, policy changes, things we could do slightly differently if we are really going to be sincere in promising families that we're going to be there for them, we really are going to help them, um, and that they really are up against it in a very unfair and just kind of disgraceful way when it comes to families who have seriously mentally ill adult relatives. Is there, has there been any sort of work or study of whether the families themselves are able to shoulder that burden well? So, I mean, the homeless population are generally people who, the seriously mentally homeless were once part of a family um, before things split. They were housed. They were housed by their family. Um, but that didn't work out for them. And so there had to be um, a separation. And that can happen for, you know, a number of different reasons. I mean, sometimes they have to be told told to leave because they're not safe um and other times they leave voluntarily because there's like a disagreement about families wanting them to act in a certain way that will improve their life and they have different interpretations of what improving their life would mean i just think it's really interesting to think of this again this this, this balance between government and the family and in a way, and so i'm in a way with that article trying to own this idea that yes we are committed to community-based mental health. We're not going back to the old institutional regime. Yes. But let's talk about what that would mean 
it would have to mean more deference to the family. And I'm also, in a way, trying to, in that piece, kind of own the idea that, yeah, mental illness is kind of this, like, it really is this, like, social phenomenon. Like, you can define a lot of it, like, without any reference or very little reference to kind of medically what's going on to just like socially, like how they're behaving in society and what their relationships are with other people. Like that's what anti-psychiatric or psychiatry skeptical people want to look at. But if you're serious about that, of really quote, integrating somebody into society, allowing them to live a normal life, you know, what do we need to change in order to make that happen? Because it's just failing. So, um, so often there are lots and lots of um, books written by families. If you go to the mental health system of se- section of the library or the bookstore, you will see many, many memoirs of families, family memoirs, um, like Hidden Valley Road. There was this one by uh, Jonathan Rosen that came out this year or about this um, person he knew that committed a mentally ill atrocity. He goes, so a lot of journalism, and I try to read as much of this stuff because it's really fascinating and it, and it reveals, you know, just what, how it works in terms of these like frayed, very precarious um, relations between mentally ill people and these, you know, caseworkers, these like by blood who are, de- who are devoted to them, who understand their nuances and who are willing to put up with a lot. Um, but oftentimes do reach their breaking point. And that's what, when we lead to violence, incarceration, homelessness, and so on. You also, in that piece, I think, you do a good job of connecting it to some of your other writing about, and again, this connects back to the political sort of philosophy aspect of it, which is if a severely mentally ill person just gets housed, and okay, we solved your problem, here's your housing. I mean, that person may have all these other problems that you know, their family has to deal with. They may want to live with their family. They may not even want to live alone. But this is just, they're all being forced into the single sort of set of values. And I think one of the things about families that makes it a bit different is families, to some degree, this is due to the lived experience aspect, but families we feel more deferent towards in terms of values, right? So they also pose the ability to sort of be a, a good political unit if you're trying to make change, is appealing to families. Not You don't have to appeal to family values per se, but the values of families just inherent in caring about your child or wanting the best care for your child, I think, you know, could push this agenda a long way, because otherwise, you then are deferring to the, at least in the sort of public opinion realm, mostly the lived experience of some of these people. But generally speaking, the ones who are going to be talking about their lived experience are not representative of most of the people who need real help. Yeah, or professional advocacy groups is oftentimes the way this debate shapes up. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they they kind of co-op the family advocates and the family advocates get kind of turned around and used in ways that are ultimately counterproductive. But the families that keep their wits about them, and this is a totally totally new kind of lobbying force on the scene. The families were not active voices in mental illness policy before you know the 1970s and they felt like they really had to get involved and they do stuff like you know mutual aid at the local level they just like you know if if you have a a child who had a break and you have no idea what the rest of your life is going to look like so you can meet with you know this group called nami chapters or, or everywhere and they can they can you know help you sort of understand you know what you're up against and maybe help you na- begin to navigate the system that's very valuable and if you didn't have that you would have um very little because otherwise it's just like unresponsive government bureaucracies and they have this eloquence um you know it's sort of like well two two can play the lived experience game i mean the lived experience of families has a has a power that's often greater than you know, what uh, What experts, certainly policy researchers, and maybe even, you know, psychiatrists, people with clinical experience can say. So, uh, yeah, I mean, to the extent that we've gotten any um, beneficial changes, any any reforms that benefit the serious mentally ill, always the families have had their hand in that over the past recent decades. So to close out, why don't we just talk about sort of where you see this overall system going in the future? You've already said, you know, people are waking up to, okay, there needs to be more serious care for the seriously mentally ill. From what I I gathered from what you just said, I I don't think you think big institutions are going to come back, at least in the way they were were prior. But do you sort of see 
a mix of the community-based care system we have now, but sort of with more authority in it so that more decisive judgments can be made. People who need more extreme care can get it even without their, you know, explicit consent or something like that. Do you see that sort of being the future? Yeah. I mean, we need to invest more in inpatient psychiatric beds just because it just went so far, you know, and the pendulum swung so far. So we need to talk about how to get more inpatient psychiatric beds for people who need that type of intervention, Um, because the alternative for so many people is going to be violence, incarceration, just worse outcomes, even though I understand that being committed to a psychiatric hospital is not like an attractive outcome. Um, it's still better than many alternatives for certain people. And then the when you talk about involuntary treatment, yeah, there are other things that we can do. You can have some sort of like formal su- supervision through um, what's called assisted outpatient treatment, still Kendra's Law in New York, um, conservatorship, which was kind of wrongly got a bad rap during the whole Britney Spears um, controversy and other things that can be done through the court system for people who are involved in, in courts, which is a very important uh, cohort. So do, you know, coercion and voluntary treatment, sort of depriving people of civil liberties. I mean, you're providing a degree of supervision that, yeah, people without serious mental illness don't have to be subjected to, but which is going to provide a degree of structure. And also a, it's going to prevent more s- severe interventions like jail or like um, hospitalization. That needs to be more normalized. People need to be more familiar with it. it needs to be understood. I mean, it needs, needs to be destigmatized. Like that's understood that it's just, you know, it's it's an appropriate thing to do. Um, in, in some of these case, in a lot of these cases, the legal powers are there. You don't even necessarily have to pass a new law, but you need to decide to kind of you know normalize it and then you know use these powers more than you are currently. Um, using them. And that I think would make a difference with the serious mental ill. Well, that's, that's good to hear, you know, because it shows that, okay, if someone just had the right leadership, and they had the right ideas, they could actually make a big difference and, you know, help a lot of these people and really improve their lives as well as the, you know, lives of, of people in the public, without necessarily having to pass a bunch of new laws or change public opinion significantly or something like that. But I, I think that's, that's really good to hear. And I'm that's sort of where I see things going to. I think with Jordan Neely and and cases like that, I think people are increasingly coming to realize, okay, it's not compassionate to have people who are severely mentally ill just running around the streets. Giving people just housing isn't just purely compassionate. Part of being, you know, a compassionate society is going to be somewhat paternalistic and, you know, setting some kind of standard. And even though we may struggle with what that standard should be, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be there. Stephen, it's been amazing talking to you. Where can people who want to read more of your work uh, go to? Oh, well, all my research and publications are posted at the Manhattan Institute's website, manhattan.institute. Okay, terrific. Well, uh, thank you again, Stephen, and have a great day. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jenna. Jenna.